این یاران سرمست جام پیمان و در محبت سرگشته و با دیه پیما از فراغت پر احترامت و به اشراقت در نهایت اشتیاق از ملکوت جهان پنهان تجلی نویت نما و پرتو موهبت افشان هر دنگم فیزی جدید فرق و فضلی بدی حدید فرما ای پروردگار ما ناتوانیم تو توانا مورانیم و تو سلیمان ملکوت ابها انایتی فرما موهبتی به نما تا شعله زنیم و لمعه نسار کنیم قوتی به نماییم و خدمتی مجرا داریم سبب نورانیت این جهان ظلمانی گردیم و روحانیت در این خاک دان فانی دمی نیا و خود را به شعون فانی نیا بزم هدایت بیا را و به خون خیش آیات محبت به نگاری خوف و خطر بگذاریم شجر پرسمر شویم 
و در این جهان بی بنیان سبب ظهور کمالات عالم انسان گردی اینکه انتل کریم و رحیم قفور و Who came as 
exactly as foretold by Christ. Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah came for all mankind. He brought us love and peace of mind. He says man should live as one. There is no place for us to run. Who brought this message of love to mankind? Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah Who said that justice is best in his sight? Baha'u'llah, Baha'u'llah Baha'u'llah came for all mankind He brought us love and peace of mind He says man should live as one there is no place for us to run. Baha'u'llah came for all mankind. He brought us love and peace of mind. He says man should leave us one. There is no place for us to run. There is no place for us to run. There is no place for us to run.
a lot of offerings. In convening this great Congress and the countless other gatherings around the globe this week, the Universal House of Justice has called on Baha'is everywhere to celebrate the inauguration of Baha'u'llah's covenant and to proclaim its aim and unifying power. We can bring to this moment no greater testimony than the transforming effect the covenant has had on our abilities to serve the cause of God. Of the unnumbered stories of achievements that might be recounted, many of which are represented here in this room, we hope that these three will speak for what is in the hearts of all of us. When the Guayami people first came in touch with the Baha'i faith, they asked the Baha'is to help them restore their culture. Mr. Juan Beherano is here to share his story with us. Abdul Baha, el exponente más perfecto de la revelación de Baha'u'llah, dijo lo siguiente. Abdul Baha, the most perfect exponent of the Baha'i revelation, said the following. Si estos nativos llegan a recibir una educación y son guiados correctamente, no cabe duda que iluminará a todo el mundo entero. If these native peoples receive education and are guided properly, there is no doubt that through the teachings, the divine teachings, they will become so enlightened that they will illumine the world. Muy buenos días, queridos hermanas y hermanos Baha'is, alawabha. Es un privilegio para el pueblo Guaymí de recibir el bello mensaje de Bajaola. Y en estos momentos tomo esta oportunidad para dirigirme a ustedes. It is a privilege for the Guaymí people to receive the beautiful message of Bajaola. And at these moments, I'm happy to take this time to speak with you. Lo más importante es que quiero decirle es que el pueblo Guaymí ha abrazado la causa de Bajaola y quiere ser obediente a sus enseñanzas. The most important thing I have to tell you is that the Guaymí people have accepted the cause of Bajaola and are trying to be faithful to his teachings. Por eso, queremos ser fieles a la institución administrativa de la fe Baha'i, a la asamblea espiritual les locales, a la asamblea espiritual nacional y a la Casa Universal de Justicia, institución infalible de Dios. And that is why we want to be faithful to the institutions of the administrative order, which are the local spiritual assemblies, the national spiritual assembly, 
and the universal house of justice, the institution that is infallible of God. Bajo la guía de ellas, se están estableciendo proyectos de desarrollo socioeconómica, como son la Radio Bahá'í, el Centro Cultural Guaymí y Escuela para Educación de Niños. Under their guidance, we are establishing social economic development projects such as Radio Baha'i, the Guaymi Cultural Center, and the children's schools. Bajo, la, bajo esta institución se desarrollan programas de profundización, de alfabetización, conferencias de mujeres, consejos nativos, se desarrollan campañas de enseñanzas y otros. Under the institutions mentioned, we're developing literacy programs, women's conferences, native councils, children's education, teaching projects, and others. Por medio de estos programas, hemos estado logrando un efecto transformador en el área para ayudar a nivelar la calidad de vida espiritual del pueblo Guaymi. And through these programs, we are having a transforming effect to help balance the spiritual life of the Guaymi people. Estos ejemplos positivos demuestra que poco a poco estamos entendiendo el convenio de Bajaola y tratando de servirla. These positive examples demonstrate that little by little, we're coming to understand the covenant of Baha'u'llah and trying to serve him. ¿Qué más queda a este humilde pueblo de ser el instrumento de Baha'u'llah? What else can this humble people do but be the instrument of Baha'u'llah? Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Bejerano. India has the largest Baha'i community in the world. <laughs> Among the more recent and equally thrilling stories from that subcontinent, is the success of the Indoor Project. The Indoor Project was recognized by the Global 500 Awards issued by the United Nations Environment Program, which is equivalent to Nobel Prize for Ecology. Please welcome Mrs. Janik Palta McGilligan, who is Punjabi, and the director of the Institute. Dear friends, I bring greetings to you from India and share with you that the Baha'i Vocational Institute for Rural Women in Indore is one of the socio-economic development projects of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of India. It's built on the land which was bought, which was chosen when bought by the beloved hand of the cause of God, Dr. Mohajir. <clears throat> Since 1985, the Institute has trained over 550 rural and tribal women in improving the quality of life of their families and their communities with their own efforts. Coming from socially deprived 
and economically disadvantaged and highly caste ridden society where the literacy level is not more than 4%. These simple grassroots illiterate women have acquired skills which include literacy, health and environmental education, vocational skills and application of spiritual values in their life. When these women came to the institute for training, they thought and they think now that they have come to learn to sew or to learn some skills to generate some income. But very soon they discover that they have to be literate in order to do so. While three months they are with us and they learn literacy along with the skills, they come to know the purpose of life. This motivates them with the spirit of service for their communities. They go back, they help their communities in educating them, they start children classes, they help the communities in elimination of caste prejudices. They have started to stop men drinking alcohol. There are examples where these women have established unity in the divided communities and in the divided families and in their personal life too. These newly trained women have managed to eradicate guinea worms in 302 villages by just educating the village folks how to take safe drinking water. This achievement brought the Baha'i Vocational Institute this global role of honor 500, which is for environmental achievements. It is these simple women who feel and they claim that they have achieved all this with their knowledge and teachings of Baha'u'llah. They are little candles in their areas spreading the light of Baha'u'llah. They love Baha'u'llah. Thank you very much, Mrs. McKilligan. We have all heard about the marvelous victory of the faith in its participation at the 1992 Earth Summit in Brazil. This story is vast in scope and serves as a witness to the victories attainable when we work in concert with each other from different countries and when we support our administrative order and its national and international institutions and agencies. The prominence and contribution of the Baha'i community to the Earth Summit cannot now be summarized. However, Mrs. Venus Sahihi Pezesh can share some small insight with us into the transforming power of Baha'u'llah's covenant. Alawatha, dear friends. First, I bring the love of the Brazilian Baha'is to all of you. 
to talk. Thank you. To understand the transforming power of Baha'u'llah's covenant at the Earth Summit, we have first to know a little bit more about what was the Earth Summit 92 about. The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development, also called the Earth Summit 92, was the largest gather ever of heads of state and government to come together to discuss and plan the future of humanity. More than 100 heads of state, 178 delegations from all nations were there in Rio in June 92. And for me and for the Baha'is who were there, this was a rehearsal of that great gathering that Baha'u'llah had prophesied more than 100 years ago and the House of Justice had called for to establish the lesser peace. The significance of the Baha'i participation at this historic gathering was because this was a unique opportunity for the Baha'is to apply the Baha'i principles to a concrete and collective effort of humanity to bring together our common future. We started working from the very beginning, two and a half years ahead of time, planning, organizing, and finally implementing many projects. We did three proposals. When I say we, I am talking about the Baha'i International Community Office of the Environment and the National Spiritual Assembly of Brazil Office of the Environment that worked very closely together for more than two years to make concrete proposals for the main conference and to set up and implement five major events for the Global Forum, the parallel meeting of more than 12,000 non-governmental organizations and 30,000 people from around the world that were, were gathered in Rio. Three proposals were made, one about the Earth Charter, the second one about environmental legislation, and the third one about men and women partnership for a healthy planet. And they were widely distributed among all the people present, dignitaries and officials and heads of state. And we did also, a, we delivered a statement at the plenary of the official conference in the first day of the conference as the only non-governmental organization of the religious sector to do that. We also implemented and planned the unity show. These events were at the Global Forum, the parallel event. The unity show was showing all the diversity of culture and music from around the world. We did also an exposition where we showed our social economic projects and environmental projects around the world. And at this booth, we distributed more than 100,000 leaflets to all the people who were there. And we had an statistics that people from 123 countries came through our booth and journalists from more than 80 countries passed by our booth. This is the power of the Covenant of Baha'u'llah.
We also realized a symposium on values and spiritual changes for a sustainable society. We also made an international contest with our children from all around the world, and we set up a beautiful book in conjunction with UNICEF that was delivered to the heads of state that were present there and to all dignitaries and non-governmental organizations called Tomorrow Belongs to the Children. And this book had drawings and messages from our children addressing environment and development to the heads of state. We had an exposition of this book also. And finally, we had the Peace Monument. This big, five meters tall, concrete structure in a form of an hourglass containing samples of soil from all participating countries in the Earth Summit as a symbol of the will for peace, of unity and unity of the people of the world who were participating in that historic event. <laughs> Dear friends, I would like to share with you the principles that were responsible for the success of the Baha'is at this event, that were responsible for the Baha'is being recognized as the most organized NGO and the most effective message-giving NGO at the Earth Summit and the Global Forum. <laughs> These principles were unity, steadfastness, and faith. Unity among the group, a small group, of three to five people that started the work and that grew up up to 130 Baha'is from more than 20 countries that were present at the event. Absolute unity in between everyone. A steadfastness in everything we have proposed ourselves to do. We would never give up every stone that was on our way. We knew that it was a step up to get higher the name of Baha'u'llah. And faith, faith that nothing will fail when we are there giving our best to proclaim His holy name. To finish, I would like to share with you two small stories of the maybe hundreds I could tell you about the miracles we witnessed at this Earth Summit and its preparation period. The first story is about the evening series. About eight months before the Earth Summit and the Global Forum, the coordinator of the Global Forum a very well-known environmentalist, Mr. Warren Lindner, came to us and invited the Baha'is to coordinate the evening series in the park. This was to be an entertainment program to show the cultural diversity, music and art from all the people that were going to participate in the Global Forum. We were very honored with the invitation, but we asked him, why are you inviting the Baha'is in within 12,000 NGOs that are working for this event? And his answer was, because the Baha'is are the only group that can understand and deal with the diversity of cultures from all around the world and that can input a spiritual character to this event. And I don't want this event to be only an entertainment event.
this story haven't finished yet. <laughs> because we worked on it for almost eight months. And just on time when it was going to go on and everything was planned, the Global Forum went out of money and the program was not going to go on. And just the coordinator said, I'm sorry, we won't have money to set up everything. We need $80,000 for that. But because of our faith and our perseverance that nothing that we plan for Baha'u'llah is going to fail, this program not only went on, but it was the heart and the soul of the Global Forum. And it was the place where more than three to 4,000 people will gather every night in a spirit of unity and love and entertainment. This is one of the miracles of the Earth Summit. And the last story is about the Peace Monument. This project that was proposed by the Baha'is to be the symbol of the Global Forum and accepted by the direction of the Global Forum as long as we did everything. <laughs> well, it went on because we got the support of the mayor for the land, of the Brazilian historic agency for the authorization to put it in a historical site and of a non-Baha'i construction firm that is sponsored and constructed the monument. And it was inaugurated with most dignity at the last day of the Earth Summit. And it was proclaimed by all international media as the symbol, the concrete symbol of the Earth Summit and the Global Forum. And at the inauguration session, with the presence of the mayor of Rio, with ministers, prime ministers, environmental ministers from around the world, and many, many people, the coordinator of the Global Forum, talking, giving his speech, he started saying, dear friends, people from all around the world came here to Rio, not to discuss environment or development. They came to Rio to testify these words that are written in the peace monument. The earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Venus. Of course, friends, we all know that the success of the Earth Summit in Brazil really is due to the obedience and response of a handful of friends from around the world to the call of our beloved guardian during the 10-year crusade who went pioneering to Brazil, amongst them the parents of Venus Sahihi. <clears throat> what you have just heard are some of the fruits of the tablets of the divine plan revealed by Abdul Baha and achieved by obedience to the covenant as emphasized by our beloved guardian and the universal house of justice. Let's now reflect on the covenant in action.
source of the unity of humankind, the generating force that carries forward the complicated affairs of the faith, the transforming power that moves hearts and dashes into a thousand pieces all the forces of opposition, is the covenant of Baha'u'llah. Abdu'l-Baha wrote, The axis of the oneness of the world of humanity is the power of the covenant and nothing else. For 29 years, Abdu'l-Baha was the embodiment of his father's covenant, its appointed center, the branch of command which encompasses all existence. He was the focus of the unifying power of the cause. To the believers, Abdu'l-Baha was the cause. Then suddenly, unexpectedly, he was gone. No words can describe the grief and despair which fell over the Baha'i world. Who would comfort them now? Who would unify and guide them? Who would lead them on the global mission for which Baha'u'llah had called? In his will and testament, Abdu'l-Baha revealed the design for the administrative order and identified his twin successors, the Guardian and the Universal House of Justice. A 24-year-old student, still devastated by the passing of his grandfather, young Shoghi Effendi was appointed by Abdu'l-Baha's will and testament the Guardian of the Cause of God and Interpreter of the Word of God. Abdu'l-Baha made it clear that the election of the Universal House of Justice was the final step in building the framework of the administrative order. First, the cause must spread throughout the world. It must attract a foundation of believers to elect local and finally national spiritual assemblies. Using Abdu'l-Baha's tablets of the divine plan as a blueprint for disseminating the cause and the will and testament as his authority to act, the Guardian began the awesome task of raising up the worldwide administrative order. Martha Root and a band of traveling teachers and pioneers responding to the Master's call traveled throughout the world. Queen Marie of Romania became the first royal personage to declare her faith in Baha'u'llah. Baha'i endowments and properties were purchased throughout the world. Youth activities began in earnest and Baha'i historic and holy sites were acquired. Completion of the Mother Temple of the West symbolized the obstacles facing the cause. Abdu'l-Baha had personally laid the cornerstone during his visit to Chicago, and from the beginning, Shoghi Effendi was determined to see its completion. By 1937, eight national spiritual assemblies, pillars of the future Universal House of Justice, had been raised into position. The time had come. The Guardian, armed with a small but devoted body of North American believers, began prosecution of the Master's divine plan. The first seven-year plan was launched, The opening scene, the Guardian wrote, of the first act of that superb drama whose theme is no less than the spiritual conquest of both the Eastern and Western hemispheres. Within two years, however, the world was at war. The faith was under renewed attack and repression. The Guardian appealed to the believers in the West, dare greatly, toil unremittingly, sacrifice worthily, endure radiantly, unflinchingly till very end. Their response was magnificent. 
By 1944, the number of Baha'i assemblies in North America had doubled. The costly exterior ornamentation of the Mother Temple was completed ahead of schedule. And a strong Baha'i community was established in each of 20 Latin American republics. Inspired by their fellow believers in the West, 95 Persian families left their homes to settle in neighboring lands and join the growing ranks of pioneers. Led by the beloved guardian, the worldwide body of believers had become God's victorious army of light. And in 1946, Shoghi Effendi, addressing the American Baha'i community, launched the second seven-year plan, followed by a call to the other national communities throughout the Baha'i world to adopt their own teaching plans with specific national goals. These plans would carry the healing influences of the faith to the war-ravaged, disillusioned peoples of Europe. They would consolidate the faith in the Americas and throughout the world, complete the temple, and erect three more pillars of the future Universal House of Justice, the National Assemblies of Canada, Central America, and South America. The European campaign fired the imagination of Baha'is all over the world. And despite severe economic hardships, once again, complete victory was won. Exhilarated by these exploits, the Guardian prepared his unbreachable army for the greatest single undertaking in the spiritual history of humanity. Of the Ten-Year Crusade, launched in 1953, he wrote, Let there be no mistake, the avowed, the primary aim of this spiritual crusade is none other than the conquest of the citadels of men's hearts. To the Baha'i world, even with its newfound sense of confidence, the list of goals must have seemed impossible. Erect two new temples, open 131 new territories, elect 48 new national assemblies, and reach millions of new souls, laying the foundation for the election of the first universal house of justice. Reflecting the importance of the plan, the Guardian announced four great conferences around the globe. Scores of pioneers volunteered at each conference. One hundred virgin territories were opened in the first nine months, and three-quarters of the goal countries occupied. Shoghi Effendi encouraged and mobilized his troops with a constant stream of letters and cables. His enormous body of written work, his books, his translations strengthened and deepened the believers. With the guardian at the helm, nothing could stop God's army of light. Then suddenly, without warning, dark clouds of crisis covered the horizon. On the fourth day of November, in 1957, from the World Center came the tragic news. Shoghi Effendi, the beloved guardian, had passed peacefully into the Abha kingdom. The guardian was gone. The ten-year crusade was only half finished, and the master's other successor, the Universal House of Justice, had not yet emerged. In this darkest moment, it was the limitless resources of the Covenant that sustained, unified, and empowered the believers to forge ahead. The hands of the cause of God, raised up by Shoghi Effendi as the chief stewards of the faith, led the Baha'i world in carrying out his global plan. And by the close of the Ten-Year Crusade, the conquests were complete. In April 1963, at the first Baha'i International Convention, the supreme governing body of the faith was brought into being. 
A few days later, at the first World Congress in London, England, a worldwide Baha'i community welcomed the newly elected members of the Universal House of Justice. Once again, the protecting power and vitalizing energies of the Covenant flowed unhampered through Baha'u'llah's chosen successor. The world community of believers had grown. Local spiritual assemblies numbered over 3,500. And the number of places where Baha'is lived reached in excess of 11,000. In its first message to the national conventions, the Universal House of Justice wrote, The cause of God is now firmly rooted in the world. Forward, then, confident in the power and protection of the Lord of Hosts. For the next 21 years, the Baha'i Faith moved forward at an ever-increasing pace. The work of the Hands of the Cause was extended into the future by the creation of the Continental Board of Counselors. The International Teaching Center was established. The first head of state, His Highness Malietoa Tanuma Filii II of Western Samoa, declared his faith followed by the erection in his country of the first temple in the Pacific. In 1983, the Universal House of Justice occupied its permanent seat, the soaring pillars symbolic of the 135 national assemblies participating in the election. Some three million believers now inhabited the globe. The number of local spiritual assemblies exceeded 27,000 and Baha'is lived in over 116,000 places in the world. The Baha'i faith was knocking on the door of worldwide attention when the news came. The National Assembly of Iran was arrested and imprisoned. The House of the Bab was seized and destroyed. The persecution of the Persian believers had resumed full force. National and local assemblies were outlawed, properties confiscated, the house of Baha'u'llah in Takur was destroyed. And once again, the cradle of the faith was stained with the innocent blood of men, women, and youth. Yet it was these very sacrifices that propelled the faith from obscurity. Unprecedented and worldwide media coverage exposed the faith to millions. Governments around the globe came to the defense of the Iranian believers, and the General Assembly of the United Nations, for the first time, took up the case. In October 1985, the Universal House of Justice published The Promise of World Peace and declared that global peace was the next and inevitable step in the evolution of the planet. As the fourth epoch of the formative age opened in 1986, 138 heads of state had received this important document. The truth of its vision dramatically demonstrated as the Cold War crumbled before the eyes of a peace-starved world. The astonishing Lotus Temple was dedicated in New Delhi. It stands as one of the most important buildings erected in this century. Expansion of the faith accelerated. Eastern Europe and the former republics of the Soviet Union were at last open to the conquering forces of the Covenant. The Brazilian Federal Chamber of Deputies paused for a two-hour tribute to the Blessed Beauty, which included the reading of a message from the Universal House of Justice. The Holy Year opened with moving ceremonies at the World Center, commemorating the ascension of Baha'u'llah. 3,000 believers circumambulated his shrine. A month later, the Baha'i international community was asked in particular to address the historic Earth Summit. The burgeoning influence of Baha'u'llah's revelation can now be felt in all spheres of human existence. As we prepare for the next stage in the unfolding of Abdu'l-Baha's divine plan, immense and fleeting opportunities call for a level of sacrifice and dedication reminiscent of the Guardian's courageous army of light. 
Completion of the Ark and terraces on Mount Carmel represents the unfolding of a vision of God's holy mountain, which will coincide with the emergence of the Lesser Peace and the first stirrings of the world order of Baha'u'llah. For seven long decades, the community of the greatest name has dared greatly, toiled unremittingly, sacrificed worthily, endured radiantly, unflinchingly to the very end. How unimaginably glorious are the victories awaiting God's warriors as they set their faces towards those fields that are as yet unexplored and direct their steps to those goals that are as yet unattained. Comforted and guided always by the words of the beloved guardian. Whatever may befall us and however dark the prospect of the future may appear, if we but play our part, we may rest confident that the hand of the unseen is at work, shaping and molding the events and circumstances of the world, and paving the way for the ultimate realization of our aims and hopes for mankind. Friends, we will now pay honor to the hands of the cause of God.
as the Baha'i world celebrates the centenary of the inauguration of Baha'u'llah's covenant, no more precious trace of the divine impulse that has carried us to this moment can be imagined than that the three hands of the cause of God who are still with us. Amatul Baha Ruhi Khanum immortalized in the matchless words of the beloved guardian as my helpmate, my shield in warding off the darts of the covenant breakers, my tireless collaborator in the arduous tasks I shoulder. Janab Ali Akbar Furutan, whose qualities of mind and historic contributions to the rise and consolidation of the mother Baha'i community, of the mother community of the Baha'i world, were crowned in 1951 by his elevation to the rank of Hand of the Cause of God. Janab Ali Muhammad Varga, distinguished son of one of the most distinguished families in Baha'i history and trustee of the Hughullah as that mighty institution spreads its canopy over the entire Baha'i world. The continuing presence among us of these precious souls is both a poignant reminder of the beloved guardian whom they served so faithfully and the promise of the unfailing protection with which Baha'u'llah has surrounded his cause. For all time to come, their names and the names of the 23 faithful colleagues who served with them as chief stewards of the cause will be associated with the tribute penned for them by the Universal House of Justice itself. The entire history of religion shows no comparable record of such strict self-discipline, such absolute loyalty, and such complete self-abnegation by the leaders of a religion finding themselves suddenly deprived of their divinely inspired guide. The depth of gratitude which mankind for generations, nay, ages to come, owes to this handful of grief-stricken, steadfast, heroic souls is beyond estimation. Friends, Please welcome our beloved, dearly cherished, and ever inspiring hand of the cause of God, Janab Ali Akbar Furutan.
تمام می کنم ابدا فکر وقت نباشید تمام Beloved friends, I remember in my youth when I was reading the tablets of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, and the beloved guardian. I could find several references about the future of the Baha'i faith. In my youth, in those days, Reading these tablets, it was only my hope. It was sometimes even dilemma for me when and how all these things revealed by Baha'u'llah, by Abdul Baha, by the beloved guardian, will be fulfilled. In those days, not only me, Maybe many of the Baha'is, they were waiting for future because it was the days of difficulties, of sacrifices, of martyrdom, and all kinds of difficulties. After 53, that the be beloved guardian instructed hands of the cause to participate in four intercontinental conferences. And I was one of them. I traveled around the world, five continents. I realized that whatever was revealed before in the tablets is gradually is happening. Not all that I was expected in my mind, in my heart, but many of them was fulfilled. Now, for instance, I was witness of mass conversion in many areas. When Baha'u'llah says to Nasiruddin Shah in the tablet of Sultan, as we call, so fair, yaftahullah le madinatihi baban retaja Baha'u'llah said to Nasir bin Shah that very soon God will open, it's my rough translation of course, the very large gate for his city and in that day the people will enter to this city by troops. Then I realize now it's the beginning of that promise, of that prophecy of Baha'u'llah. Then I was witness for election of the Universal House of Justice in 1963. It was my hope, it was my pleasure to be alive and see this infallible institution coming to the existence. I saw that. Then I participated in first intercontinental all the world by Congress in London. 7,000 people were there. I said, oh my God, what I am seeing, could I imagine it was illusion for me in my youth. Now I see 7,000 Baha'is came to the first world Baha'i Congress with different nationalities, different dresses, different backgrounds. Then I was witness for several things that it was just imagination. For instance, now I know that the cause of Baha'u'llah was spread in 125,000 localities. In those days, if somebody would say that to me, I say, well, inshallah, God willing, for future, let us wait. But it happened. And not only Baha'i say that, 
Encyclopedia Britannica, giving statistics of religion, they say so. Then I'd had the great privilege in my life to meet the beloved guardian in the Holy Land. I meet the guardian in the Holy Land I met about uh, twice, first in 1941 and second 54. I remember one day the beloved guardian talked about Russia to us, to about eight, nine pilgrims. I remember his exact words by heart in Persian. He said, Bezudi, Parchamiya Baha al Abha, Dar Qutb Siviria, Kahal Manfawi Baha Yanez, Bemosh Hawada. It was in very dark time of Russia when the Guardian said that in '54. I said, Baha'i, of course I did believe that it will happen. No doubt in my mind, in my heart. But again, the dilemma was when and how. Fortunately, he promised me also that you will go back to Russia when I was banished back to Iran. It's a long story, I am not going to that. I mean what the Guardian said, it's happened, literally happened. He said, as mashaukila haoliye malul wa absurdamayir. Don't be sad from the events that is now happening. Ozae hazire darun aqalim bagave sigrari nadar. The present situation in those countries would not remain like that. Then he promised me that in future you will go back to Russia to render some services there, but repeatedly said, be patient. Sabr wa tahammul lazim. Be patient. You know how I am, I, I was patient? How many years? Six years. Six, six, zero. It was in 1930, I received this letter of the Guardian, this tablet of the Guardian, as we say. And by the order of the beloved House of Justice, I went to Moscow for re-establishing, re-electing, electing the local assembly. In 91, again, the House of Justice ordered me to go back to Russia for election of National Spiritual Assembly of Soviet Union. For you, it is very difficult to understand because you grow up in free countries. It's very difficult for you to understand that after 60 years, I went back 90 and 91 twice to Russia. And 92, again, the House of Justice ordered me to go to not the former Soviet Union, to Baltic states and Hungary. And I went for regional national assembly there. Uh, it was imagination for me, illusion. I couldn't believe my eyes when I was there in my own university in that country that they pushed me back. They sent me just like this back to Iran. My point is, dear friends, whatever revealed by Baha'u'llah, by Abdul Baha, by the beloved guardian, it, many of them was fulfilled and still we have so many things to do. I am now very thankful to Baha'u'llah that I am living in these days, meeting you where? 
in the Second World Congress, it could not be imagined to me that I will be alive to be in such beautiful, grand Congress and see by my own eyes all kinds of nationalities, background. You cannot understand my sentiments when I see all these things because I heard from the beloved guardian it will happen. Now I am witness, I witness, I see, I see by my own eyes. In future, just a few words more. In future, we have still too many things to do. It's not the end. The humanity is sick. You know that. The divine physician for our age is Baha'u'llah. Only Baha'u'llah. When we say we should teach the faith of Baha'u'llah, what do you mean with that? We mean to purify the hearts of people from prejudices, from hatreds, from animosity, to prevent bloodshed that every day, every minute, even right now that we are here, is going on. To bring unity to humanity. This is Baha'i teachings. Baha'i teaching me to unite people, to prevent bloodshed, to bring them together, especially our youth, Baha'i youth, especially, of course, all Baha'is have this obligation because Baha'u'llah says to teach the cause is obligatory for everybody. It's obligation. No one is an exception. No one. But the youth could do more, of course. Could do more. When I was young, I could do many things that I am not doing that. You see, somebody should take my hand and take down. But I was all over the world in five continents, in 55 countries, my dearest. When you are young, you should realize that, that it would not remain for you for all the time. Use that. Use your power, your energy to teach the cause of Baha'u'llah, to free people from bloodshed. That is expectation of Baha'u'llah, Abdul Baha, the beloved guardian, and now the hearts of justice, expecting, they are waiting for us to do. And I beg you to have me in your prayers to live a little longer, a little, not too much. I know it's impossible. I know that. Just a, a few years, a few years, very little, to see more and more and more. Then I will die, I would say, thanks to God, I saw everything what I read in my youth in the tablets. Please, friends, now join me in welcoming from the depth of our hearts our dearly loved and cherished hand of the cause of God, Janab Ali Muhammad Varga.
beloved friends, Allah Abha. I am greatly honored to be able to attend this wonderful Congress held in the City of Covenant in the occasion of the century of the passing of Baha'u'llah and the inauguration of his mighty covenant. This is a great day for all of us. The city of New York have to remind those memorable days that the beloved master in his historic trip journey in the West landed in this blessed city, showered his favor on the Baha'is and also all the audiences that participate in his talk. At his first public meeting in the Church of Ascension, he raised the call of unity of mankind and called the leaders of the countries, of the states, to join together to establish the peace. Called the urgency, the necessity of the establishment of harmony between the people of the world. While the leaders of the states the heads of the government were engaged in the conflicts, severe conflicts, and prepared the way for the First World War. Racial prejudice was prevailed at that time in such an extent that when the Baha'is wanted to celebrate the Day of Covenant in the same year, at the presence of the beloved master. The, own of the, the owner of the hotel, which was assigned to, sell, to held the jubilee, the, held the, the gathering, refused to allow the black Baha'is to participate on that occasion. But now, after 80 years, the same city, New York, the city of Covenant, witnessed such a beautiful gathering, such a huge gathering of the lovers of Abdul Baha, of the Baha'is around the world. This was Garden of Baha'u'llah. This harmonious, colorful, human mosaic, diversified by nationality, by culture, by tradition, but unified by heart, by mind, and by belief. Gather together to pay homage to the threshold of Baha'u'llah, to, deep, to deeper their understanding about his revelation, and to tighten it to strengthen the tie of his mighty covenant. Could you imagine how delightful is Abdul Baha in his, whose invisible presence is felt in our heart, in our gathering, is delighted to see that his wishes reflected in many tablets, including the momentum tablet of divine plan, has fulfilled by the hand of his followers. As his followers. How delighted he is to see, through the continual guidance of the House of Justice, the banner of the unity of mankind is waving in four corners of the world, shedding light on the path of universal peace. This is a great day, beloved friends. Indeed, we cannot anticipate how will be the outcome of this Congress. But if you compare what happened in the first Congress in 63, we compare 
our assets at that time. The Baha'i Bahai population was an, about half a million people. Our institution, National Spiritual Assemblies, were 58. But during this time, you raised to serve the faith. You raised to propagate the face of God around the world. And now we witness the outcome of that. You went as pioneers, as travel teachers. You participate in different projects, and that is the outcome. That is the harvest that we gain from your endeavor and your sacrifice. Now we have more than five million Baha'is around the world. Now we have more than 150 national spiritual assemblies, and they are increased, and there's many, many victories on the way, and that is the result of covenant and your endeavor. <laughs> but dear friends, our way is very, very long. We are at, at the beginning of a long way to go. The beloved guardian in Atlanta of divine justice stated that when the turmoil and agitation grows in the world, increase in the world, our redemptive mission for guiding humanity should increase also. It becomes more challenging, more urgent, urgent more imperative. Now we are approaching the end of the century. And we know the end of the century that is the time that is promised to establish the lesser peace. But during this, this time, many things should happen. And we should mobilize our material forces and our activities, our endeavor, and put in the disposal of the House of Justice and execute, and bring, execute the next plan, the, the three years plan, and bring a victory much more excellent than the victories that we have gained until now. God bless you all, and thank you very much, dear friends. Friends, let us now welcome the beloved hand of the cause of God, whose unique and shining example has illumined the soul and the mind of generations of Baha'is, whose precious presence has been and is the source of inspiration, courage, and assurance for all of us. Please, friends, welcome with joy and gratitude the hand of the cause of God, Amatul Baha Ruhi Khanam.
Friends. <laughs> it makes me nervous when they're like that. <laughs> it's very hard, I'm sure, for all of us to take in so much emotional feeling. I know I feel like a sponge that has sucked up and sucked up and sucked up and doesn't know what to do with it, what it's got, you know. <laughs> Evidently, I'm not alone in that sensation. And I suppose that this is one of the great bounties of a gathering such as this, is that we can absorb as much as we can. Then we ha can get tapes of this wonderful occasion. We've made notes. We've followed the different talks with profound interest and attention. And we go out from here with our cup overflowing. My colleagues, my very dear fellow hands, I think have presented some of the important things in Baha'i history and in the needs of the present time very beautifully. And I'm not going to try and go on with that same theme because I think that they have expounded it very clearly. After all, they are hands of the cause and they are highly skilled. <laughs> So I thought that I would tell you a few anecdotes, things that have come to my mind about the Baha'is and about events in the past, because we're all very fundamentally simple people here. And we're devoted Baha'is, whether we're born Baha'is, whether we're Baha'is of five days standing, whether we're people that are not yet enrolled as Baha'is, Still, we're fundamentally nice, simple, sincere human beings. And then we leave this place and we go out into the world, and according to our capacities, we will try and share with others, our family, our friends, the public, our schoolmates if we're young people, we'll be our working mates in different professions and jobs that we're in, something of what this has meant to us and what it means, we think, for the city of New York and for the world. But I, the whole picture in life, aside from the, the um, great um, outlines of immense values, is always composed of little bits of pieces. And we are the little individual pieces that make up the whole. And I am always very moved by stories of Baha'is. I see things perhaps in a simple way in my mind. I see things in terms of stories and of people and of incidents. And I was thinking of my mother so often here. She was one, as you know, of the disciples of Abdul Baha. And she was a very wonderful person. And from the time she was about 20, she was almost all her life an invalid and very frail and suffered a great deal. But she was also a very dynamic servant of the faith. Whenever I came to New York with mother, which we did very often because Montreal was very cold and she suffered from the cold, so we came down sometimes for a month or two in the worst of the Canadian winter to New York and at other times. And my mother would take a taxi and she would go to 87th Street here in New York on the river on that side near the Hudson. And she would get out and stand in front of the house of Mrs. Champney. I don't know who it belongs to now or whether it even looks the way it used to. 
And she would stand there silently and pray because this was the place that Abdul Baha had been in New York. This was the place that he had lived in the Champney home and where he had received so many hundreds of guests and where he had had this great impact on the city of this very famous and very important metropolis of the world. It's nice to remember the intimate things about human beings. I can relate much easier to acts of other people and the character of other people than I can on to a long scientific treatise. I can read it. Hopefully I can understand it, but it won't move me as much as just ordinary human beings' experiences. And so I thought I would tell you a few anecdotes about the older Baha'is. When Martha Root was coming to Montreal, you know Shoghi Effendi called her the star servant of Baha'u'llah. She's the one who gave the message to Queen Mary of Romania, to other crowned heads in Europe, to presidents, to people of great importance, politically, socially, and so on. And she came to Montreal, and I was about 16 or 18, and I had, of course, a great love for my mother, and also I was very proud of my mother because I knew she was one of the first Baha'is of the West, and uh, she was May Maxwell and so on. And uh, my mother made a terrible fuss about Martha coming. And in my 16-year-old mind, I thought, well, well she's really with me. It isn't necessary to make quite so much fuss. So she bought a beautiful bunch of tulips, it was in the spring. And she put them on the radiator in the vestibule of our home in Montreal, which is now called the Baha'i Shrine because it was visited by Abdul Baha and he slept there for a few days. And as she went out to call, to have a radio call, or visit the head of the radio station of Montreal, it was the beginning of radio then, no television. And as she went out of the front door <clears throat> to go and call on the man who was the head of the radio station that my mother hoped would accept to let her speak on the air for the first time in Canadian history about the faith, she picked up one of these tulips, a raw tulip out of a vase, just one. And in those days, we were much more formal than we are now. Nobody except my age group can remember how much more what the French call comme il faut, with how much more discipline and, and uh, uh, reserve we lived our lives, at least in public. And I'd never seen anybody pick up a tulip and walk out of the front door. So Martha went down. My mother told me about this afterwards. I was not present. And she walked into the radio station and met the head of it, and my mother introduced her, said, this is Miss Martha Root. And she came, she was a very homely woman and had no sense of clothes whatsoever. <laughs> and her head was cut like a spaniel's hair, like this her hair. And she was full, <laughs> she was full of wrinkles. Anyway, she walked in, Mother said, and she walked over to this man, and she said, I brought you this, and she handed him this naked tulip without any tissue paper ending around it. And the man took the tulip in his hand, and his eyes filled with tears, and he said, how did you know I am a Dutchman? that this is my national flower of Holland. And it was finished. She could have the air. She could talk about the Baha'i faith. The whole door opened in Canada to the first radio broadcast mentioning the faith openly. As far as I remember, the very first in any case of any nature 
just because of this intuition of Martha and this one tulip to the head of the station. Another anecdote that I remember with a great deal of pleasure is Marion Jack. There are lots of Canadians here, and they will remember Marion Jack was a Canadian Baha'i. She was also a painter, extremely poor painter. <laughs> no doubt about it. Jackie's going to go down in history as a perfectly marvelous servant of the faith. And Abdul Baha called her General Jack, but she couldn't paint. <laughs> Even I could paint better. Anyway. General Jack <laughs> eventually went to Europe. I saw her in Essling in Baha'i Summer School. God bless Jackie, she was very ample. You wouldn't call her exactly fat, but she sort of in all directions, there was a lot of her. <laughs> and she had an enlarged heart. I mean, seriously, I don't know anatomical state of her heart, but I do know that it was dangerously enlarged. She was very, very poor. And she had almost no money. And she decided to go to Romania and teach the cause. And she went and got a room in a hotel in Romania. And then World War II was coming and Shoghi Fendi was worried over her, and the Baha'i Bureau in Geneva, Switzerland, was even more worried. And they sent word to her, and as I remember, they asked Shoghi Fendi if they shouldn't try and get her to leave what was going to be behind the enemy lines. She was going to be behind the lines of Hitler and his armies and allies. And uh, Shoghi Fendi did not press her but he said that if she left, of course, it, they, they were free to ask her to leave. Well, she wouldn't leave, that's the main point. And she stayed there with God knows what possibility of eating. She went out in the streets, and the hotel that she was living in was hit by a German bomb, so she couldn't even salvage any possessions from the hotel. She had what she was standing up in and the Americans, the Canadians, she was a Canadian subject, they were evacuated down to a school in the country. And she slept on a cot in a corridor in the winter. Anybody can imagine in the winter in Romania, sleeping in a corridor open at both ends with no heat. What the conditions were like. And this is how Jackie spent the war. And after the war, one of these um, international agencies of some kind or other, a woman came to call on us, and I saw her. And she said, I have been in Romania, and I have a message to tell you that Marion Jack is alive, and she's all right. And we managed to get from her an address. That was the first news we'd had of Marion all during the war. And I wrote her and asked her what she wanted. Now you can imagine this wonderful, wonderful Baha'i, this servant of Baha'u'llah, old Canadian Baha'i, under her condition, staying there all during the war, there isn't anything that any of us wouldn't have given her or done for her. And I wrote her and said, what do you want? anything that we can send you, anything we can do for you. So she sent me back two pieces of paper on which she had drawn the outline of her foot, her feet. And she said, I haven't any shoes, but if you could buy me a pair of shoes, I'd be very grateful. So I went out and bought the best pair of shoes in Haifa that these pieces of paper would fit in. And we, we send them to Marion, and that's all that Marion wanted, you see. So that's one of the kind of servants 
of the faith of Baha'u'llah that we have as our examples. Then there was... <laughs> Then there was Lillian James in New York. I suppose I'm the only person in this hall that knows who she was, the only person old enough to remember Lillian James. She became a Baha'i in Paris. She was a pianist, a very poor one, and uh, <laughs> in every sense of the word. And uh, eventually, my mother knew her there and kept up this friendship with her all their lives. She went back to Chicago, and in the worst part of Chicago, she taught the piano. And uh, I mean, really, in the slums of Chicago, she earned her living by giving piano lessons. So, eventually, she told me this herself. Eventually, she saved up enough money so that she had 25 cents that she hadn't, you know, absolutely got to spend for her room or her food. She saved it by walking, she was an old woman, to her piano lessons in Chicago. And she saved 25 cents and she sent it for the temple fund. And we were building the temple, the Mashak Alaskar and Will met at that time. And, um, So she gave this money and she got back a receipt. And then finally they had built the temple and she'd still never seen it. You know, it's very near Chicago. So she decided she was going to treat herself and she was going to go and see that temple that had been built. And she got on the train and she went out to Wilmette and she walked to where the temple was and she saw this temple in front of her and she said, all I could say was, oh, you darling. <laughs> we had another Baha'i here in New York City and I'm very glad to mention her. Her name was Carrie Marsh and she was small and stocky and tough and muscular. And her profession was to have a little tiny suitcase. And she went around to all the big dry goods stores here in New York. Of course, it was much more, well, let's say, less rigidly controlled and security and God knows what than we have today. And she used to go around with this little suitcase to the different counters and she would open her suitcase and it had safety pins and needles and thread and perhaps some aspirin tablets and things like that, notions. And she'd sell it to the serving girls who used to get off their work in New York after everything was closed at very long hours in those days. And then she would teach them the Baha'i faith. And Carrie Marsh, I was very afraid of her because she, she knew my mother, she's a great friend of my mother, and I was about eight years old at that time, and she was very strong. And every time she came to see my mother, she'd hug and kiss me and almost break my ribs. So I was really quite timid about getting hugged by Carrie. But the, that woman, and I think that these are things that are good to remember, so help me God, Carrie Marsh could have sat next to a university professor at a dinner party and talked to him about the Baha'i faith on about the same level of comprehension as another university press professor that was a Baha'i might have done. She knew the cause of God that well. And I think we have to remember that knowing the cause least of all serving it and dying for it, is not confined to a university degree. It's not confined to being literate. It's confined to how much understanding and love you have in your heart and how much common sense and wisdom you have in your head. There's no monopoly on it. The last
last election of the Universal House of Justice, and I pass this on to you because a great many of you undoubtedly come in contact with the press. You have press interviews, maybe you have radio interviews. Maybe going back from here, you will have occasion to speak about this Congress and then speak about the Baha'i principles of true brotherhood and equality, not just theoretic, but true. Uh, in our last international convention in Haifa, as I was on the stage as a Baha'i official, we had a great big theater, which was, well, not as big as this, but it, quite a big theater, big as all this area, perhaps could hold a thousand people or something, and it was full of Baha'i delegates from all over the world. It wasn't all the delegates, but it was all the delegates being present at the International Convention. And as you know, the national spiritual assemblies are the delegates for the election of the Universal House of Justice, They're the Electoral College. And as I looked this hall full of Baha'is, I saw up in the back row some Baha'is that I knew were from Ethiopia, and they happened to be villagers from Ethiopia. Violette and I had visited that village and we had met them. Totally illiterate. Couldn't write their names. And another of the delegates was a Bush Negro from Suriname, also totally illiterate. Now, for these people, the Universal House of Justice put one of the secretaries, women secretaries of our uh, staff in Haifa, at their disposal to sit next to them and write down the names. And they voted. You see, this is the caliber of the religion to which we belong. It's not just the 12 basic principles and all the intellectual teachings, if you like, and the ramifications of the administration. These are the things that make this religion worthy as a solution and will be the solution to the problems of the entire human race. It's not things in books, there are lots of books. I just want to tell you two more stories. We have a Baha'i in Haifa, a French Baha'i. For all I know, he may be here. <laughs> he lives in my house, at least on the property of Abdul Baha's property, because we have to have more people living there for security. And he walked from France to Haifa. He's a member of the staff in Haifa, serving the faith, and he got there on its two hind legs. In Madrid, years and years ago, the pioneer was called Virginia Orbison, and she was a very, very remarkable woman. As I remember, she'd already been a pioneer in South America or Central America, and she spoke Spanish fluently. She's a beautiful woman and a very beautiful person. And she went to teach the faith and pioneer in Spain. In those days, Spain was a, a very uh, religious community. They were very uh, conscious of the behavior of women. A woman could not risk her good name, she had to conduct herself in a way that would win the respect of other people and they would consider that she was a proper behaving woman. And that meant that she was not at all free to teach the way young people and older people now are when they go to teach the faith. She had to stay home a great deal in her apartment and she had to be very circumspect. And uh, I remember a conversation in the Western Baha'i Pilgrim House. There was a little tiny um, sweet young thing from Europe who was pioneering somewhere. And then there was Virginia from Spain. And so this little sweet person was complaining that she could never find anybody to teach. She said, I can never find anybody to teach. 
and people aren't interested, and she went on and on lamenting. And so Virginia drew herself and she said, up and she said, I never have any trouble finding somebody to teach. And this little woman looked at her, you know, like this. And what did she do? Oh, she said, it's very difficult. I have to be very careful. A woman alone in Spain has to be extremely careful. She said, I sit in my apartment and I pray to Baha'u'llah to send me somebody to teach, and he always does. That's how she established the faith in that country. And I think that these are the kind of people that have built the cause all over the world. These are the kind of Baha'is we have. Thank God now we have very distinguished Baha'is, very distinguished people in their professions, professors, intellectuals, and so on. And when they travel in Europe or China or the East, Asia, they add a great deal of prestige to the faith in the estimation of people. And I think that we can be very proud of this. That We never had this sort of thing when I was a girl. Baha'is in the audience of my generation, they know what this means. You take everything for granted. But just think of it, we've got opposite numbers to Chinese professors and Chinese scientists. And when our opposite number goes to China, they are received by their own type of people. They can't do mass teaching, and they often go on some kind of a scientific or academic mission. But we've got them now. We never had them before. We have them now all over the world in Asia, in Africa, North, South America, Europe, and so on. This is a tremendous step forward in the faith, and it's a very wonderful thing. And this is opening again. We are infiltrating into new areas, new zones where we can teach the faith. Then take the Baha'i youth. All of us here, and there are lots of young people here, they cannot get conceited from my remarks, please. But the fact remains that the Baha'i youth are simply wonderful. They really are. It's one of the things that I think impresses my generation very, very much. You know, we're not all little innocent angels. We're people that grew up in this society, and we knew our own nations and our own society. And the fact that we have Baha'i young people now who are exemplary in their moral behavior, who are arising to go on these various teaching trips to Russia, to the East, to different countries, and also, I am sure, throughout the Americas, this is the most marvelous development that I have seen in recent years in the cause of God. I, I had dinner the other night. The young man is probably sitting here. I hope he is and he'll hear me. Uh, I had dinner with him the other night. He's from um, Siberia, and he's a new Russian Baha'i. Lovely young man. That's exciting, you see. And if I had more contact with the audience here and had more opportunity to meet with all of you and talk to you, I would hear this story duplicated over and over and over again. It is the most marvelous thing, the kind of people that are Baha'is now, the caliber of youth that are Baha'is now, the way the youth have arisen and are serving the cause of God with understanding, with enthusiasm, with clean characters, and with knowledge, I think that we have such a marvelous setup now for spreading the word of God, the teachings of Baha'u'llah, to the whole world. And I certainly think that there's going to be a very, very great receptivity. But I would like to recommend to you, friends, 
two things. If my personal opinion from living in Haifa so long and, and being so occupied all my life with Baha'i affairs and being now so occupied the last year since the Guardian passed away with official Baha'i affairs, is that what we Baha'is lack is not love, not devotion, not even enough financial resources. We haven't got enough money to do a lot of the things we could do if we had more money. But we're not all that broke. We do manage to get around and do teach and travel and do things, you see. But what we Baha'is lack is imagination. I tell you what I mean by that. I sit here and I look down at all of you, and the ones that are well lighted and near me, I can actually see their faces, all right. And I look at you and I make this beautiful speech and then I say, well, of course, you could do it, you see. I always, well, don't point at that person, young man. Because <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that the young people and the older people, in other words, you, it's up to you. Who is going to do my work for me in this world? Who is going to live my life for me? Who, for that matter, is going to answer to Baha'u'llah for me? I've got to do it myself because the responsibility is my own. I'd like to tell you one little story of my life with Shoki Effendi. I don't remember now what it was apropos of. And um, I was always, I never, never, never obviously argued with the guardian or disagreed with anything he said or wanted. But I can remember once Shoghi Effendi uh, told me something I really can't remember. Did I want to wear it or did I want to do it? It was one of the two things. I'd been married perhaps less than a year. And Shoghi Fendi said I'd better not, because you see, it was the East and my life was no longer in Europe or America, and how I behaved myself and looked as the wife of Shoghi Fendi was quite different from Mary Maxwell. And he must have seen a little bit of disappointment in my face. And he looked at me very sweetly and he said, you have sacrificed so much. You can sacrifice this too. You know, that's a, that is a very, very profound statement. We, one way or another, we feel that we have sacrificed for Baha'u'llah. In service, in money, in devotion, in uh, changing something that we would rather have not changed, but we changed it for his sake and so on, you see. But <laughs> you can give more, in other words. Don't just say, well, I gave it once. Give it as a sort of a regular rhythm of your living that you are willing to sacrifice for the service of the cause of God because that is the service to mankind. And mankind needs service, it needs redemption, it needs to hear of the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And another thing that Shoghi Fendi said to me, which I uh, was horrified because I, I was so, I never, you know, believed that I was worthy to be the, the wife of Shoghi Effendi. But at least I said to myself, well, now I don't have to worry anymore. You know this terrible thing at the end of the econ, if you know your Baha'i scriptures well, it says, I put it in my own language, Baha'u'llah says that many a sinner, as in, in his last breath, has ascended to the up, you know, and many a saint has done a nosedive. He doesn't put it in that vocabulary, but if you look at the last, <laughs> you look at the last few pages of the econ, this is what he says, you see. And my mother was a last breather, and she was forever, you know, terrified of her last breath. Was she going to be acceptable with her last breath? So I was raised, you see, on this last breath business. <laughs> <laughs> then I, when I was married, I said, well, isn't that wonderful? I don't have to worry anymore. All those other people have to worry, but I don't have to worry because I'm tucked under the arm of Shoghi Fendi. Now I'm safe, you see. 
don't have to be, have any anxieties about my last breath. And one day she'll defend me. I don't know what it was about. It wasn't a very serious thing, but evidently he wanted to say it to me, and he did. He said, and your destiny lies in the palm of your own hand. Of course, I didn't say anything, but I just sort of looked and thought, my God, it's back again, you see. I thought, I, I, I'm making you laugh, but I assure you it wasn't a laughing matter for me. It was a terribly serious matter. You might like to hear some of the things that had happened to me uh, in the lifetime of the Guardian. One or two things, and after all, I was just Mary Maxwell of an old Baha'i family. And my mother, of course, uh, because of her services to, I think, Abdul Baha and to the Covenant, uh, maybe the reason, one reason, Shoghi Fendi married me. But I would know that I would, I'd lived, lived a very usual sort of middle class life. And uh, I can remember once um, one of the servants died in Abdul Baha's house. And um, we don't have any embalming there. First of all, the Jews don't like it, and the second, the Arabs don't like it, and the third, the Baha'is don't like it. So <laughs> we don't have it, you see. And uh, you have to bury people very quickly. So this old coachman, Esfandiar, the coachman of Abdul Baha, died, and he died around five o'clock in the afternoon. And when Shoghi Fendi came home, I waited for him because he came back from visiting the shrines with the Baha'is. And I told him Asfandiyar had died, and he came and stood by his bed for a moment. And uh, then he went upstairs, and what to do with Asfandiyar? So we had a Baha'i carpenter who was also the undertaker. And it was very convenient because he could build the coffin, you see. And he also was the Baha'i undertaker and washed the dead. And this was the funeral the next day. It says, maybe some of the people here understand this kind of a situation. They come from developing countries in Africa. And maybe the other people that live in New York City are horrified, but whatever. So that night, um, we were worried over Alias Esfandi. Uh, um, I wasn't going to be buried till 3 o'clock the next afternoon. And of course, in every way that I could, I tried to not burden Shoghi Effendi with things that he didn't have to be burdened every five minutes. What shall we do with the corpse of Asfandiar? <laughs> so <laughs> we took it downstairs and we put it in the, uh, the reception room of the male Baha'is in the old days when men and men, women were segregated. And we put him on a table and uh, put you know, bowls of water under the feet of the table so that the rats couldn't get at him. And I remember um, Khalil took the feet. <laughs> Aziz remembers Khalil in Haifa. Yadid has Khalil. And anyway, he took the feet and I took the head and we lifted this rigid corpse and put it on the table. The next day, when the funeral was taking place, the ladies never went to the cemetery because it was the custom of the Baha'i women to be like the Muslim women and more dignified, and they never went to the grave. So we were all upstairs, and we were going to have prayers, and the men were downstairs, and he was going to be taken away. And I sat there, and I thought, <laughs> where did Mary Maxwell go? What happened to Mary Maxwell? I was Mary Maxwell, you know, before I was married. And I thought, where did Mary Maxwell go? Lifting up a corpse and putting it on a table. It seemed so strange, you see, so far, far away from Montreal, Canada, and New York City, where I was born and so on. What I'm trying to say is that it's, we're all here from different backgrounds. Many of you know what I'm talking about.
because you come from cultures where you're used to that kind of thing. You wash your dead, they die at home, you bury them, you see. And of course, that's very, very far from the civilization of a big city like this. But the, fa the fact is, look at us, we're all here together. All of us of these different backgrounds, different continents, different nations, different races. And here we are in this hall, sheltered by the Universal House of Justice, eager to go out from this place and teach our fellow men the glad tidings of the message of Baha'u'llah, ready to serve at this difficult period in history in any way that we can, so that we will be worthy of having heard the name of Baha'u'llah. I'm sure that marvelous things are going to go all over the world, out of this gathering, through all these Baha'is here. Lawe gudirava e, lawe gudirava e. Lalo dia oye mugau karatau dia dekenai oye habo atamona. Ona oye mu ura gau badana oye idia hedina raya. Idia oye mu dala murinai lak lao, ona oye mu taravatu kamonaya. Oye duru dia dirava e, edia gau karadekenai, ona goa da oye heni dia. Oi de kena gau kara totona dirava e edia sibodia de kena oi idia lakatania lasi idia edia aina gabuna oi emudiba ena dia ri de kena oi guna laidia bona edia lalodia oi hemu lalokau de kena 
oi hamualea, momokani, oi be edia druva diravana, ona edia lohia, bahaula.